So hello everyone and welcome to this session of the Permit COE webinar series. Today, Marta Lloret Ginares and Vera Matzer are going to talk about the Permit COE competency framework to guide training and career development. My name is Daniel Tomas Lopez. I am involved in Permit COE on behalf of Envel DBI and I am going to host this webinar. Before starting, I would like to make you aware that this webinar is being recorded, including the questions and answers section and that the recording will be disseminated afterwards. After the presentation, we will have time for questions. So please use the Q&A button in your Zoom panel for asking questions during the webinar. Permit COE is the HPC Exascale Center of Excellence for Personalized Medicine in Europe. Permit COE focuses on simulation of cellular mechanistic models which are essential to translate the omics data into medical actions. The performance of cell simulation software is nowadays not enough to address problems such as tumor evolution or finding personalized treatment for patients. So Permit COE will scale up the software for cell simulations to the present HPC accessing systems in order to enable the creation of models of cellular functions of medical relevance. So the project is, is going to achieve this goal through, through a series of objectives. First, it will optimize selected cell level simulation software to run in pre scale platforms. Second, Permit COE is developing a series of use cases that will showcase the application of Permit COE products in different fields of clinical interest, such as drug synergies for cancer treatments or performing multi-scale modeling of COVID-19. Uh, virus and patients tissue. Additionally, Permit COE also has as, as objectives integrating the Permit COE communities into the European HPC exascale ecosystem and developing a sustainability plan. Finally, all these objectives related are related to a fifth one, the training of biomedical professionals, a program that trains professionals in the use of Permit COE software uh, professionals that will understand and embrace the use cases that become part of the permit community and that by adopting permit COE products will contribute to its sustainability. Today we are going to learn more about how the permit COE training program has been created. Let me now introduce our speakers, Dr. Vera Matzer and Dr. Marta Lloreginares. Vera is a coordinator at the MBOLIBI. She leads a team that contributes to the training and dissemination activities of EU-funded projects. To assess the training needs of the different research communities, she coordinates the development of competency frameworks and training programs. In addition, she graduated from the RI Train Embry Executive Masters in Management of Research Infrastructures in 2020. Marta is a scientific project manager at EMBOLIBI. She leads the training activities of uh, Horizon 2020 grants by Excel and Permit COE, which run competency-based training programs. Marta is a product owner of the Embel EBI Competency Hub, a repository of competency frameworks that define the abilities required by professionals in a specific field and relate them to training resources and career profiles. So Marta, Vera, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Can you see my screen? Yes. Perfect. Okay, so thank you for inviting us and we're very pleased to tell you a little bit about the approach we've been taking um, generally in competency-based training programs and then specifically for Permit COE. So I'll start today and I'll give you a bit of an introduction on generally why we use a competency-based training approach. And then I'll hand over to Marta, who will tell you more about the Permit COE training program and the functionality of the Embel EBI Competency Hub. Now, Danielle's already kind of introduced um, Permit to you, but I want to take a step back and I want to talk briefly about why the HPC Exascale Centers of Excellence were actually um, started. So they were designed um, in order to promote the use of high performance computing capabilities and to scale up existing parallel codes in order to get to Exascale performance. So 
Permanent CUE covers the area of personalized medicine, but there are other CUEs as well. And the CUEs cover areas such as engineering, and there you might have a use case about improving aerodynamics on cars and airplanes, but also things like modeling natural disasters or to build more powerful biomolecular simulations. So each of these centers of excellence actually covers and supports a specific user community. So one of the areas that the CEOs tackle is to try and close the skills gap. And of course, that's easier said than done, because what is the skills gap? I mean, I think we can probably all agree that the skills gap is large, um, that it's difficult to close. And in order to really even begin to address um, what an individual or professional might need to know in order to, to work in this field, um, we need to de define that um, and also how a center of excellence might be able to, to address um, the gap. So in the case of um, permit COE, it's clear that an individual working in the setting would need to have knowledge of HPC systems, um, parallel programming skills. They potentially need um, a knowledge of life science. Um, there will be a need for medical or clinical uh, knowledge, depending on their, their job profile. And of course, there are other skills as well. And one of the ones that immediately comes to mind is, for instance, LC, all of the legal aspects, um, the ethical aspects that come with working with human data. But it isn't just purely the areas that um, a skills program would need to address. It's also that different user groups in the community aren't identical and they, they won't have the same needs. So for instance, a developer of scientific tools, maybe with a life science background, will need to know very different things, will need to learn different things from, for instance, a biomedical researcher or a senior researcher or a software architect. Not only do they need to have sufficient competence to do their own activities, but they'll also need to have enough overlap with each other to communicate um, and work efficiently with, with others in the field. And to define all of this, we use a competency-based training program. So what is a competency? Now, I like to start with an example because it becomes a bit more clear. So this is an example from the Permit TUE competency profile. Install or deploy pre-built software on a desktop or server uh, computer. As Vera was saying, an example of a competency, the part in pink here, install or deploy pre-built software on a desktop or server computer. Uh, and then within each of these competencies, we add some knowledge, skills, and attitudes that individuals need to, to have to, to show competence in this. Uh, and this can add detail about uh, what the skill set is. So for example, the knowledge could be knows dependencies of software and the skills is selects appropriate package code. Uh, and then there can be some attitudes like checks licensing before installing or running software. So here there are just two examples of each knowledge, skills and attitudes, but in general, in the competencies that, that we are making, we usually have more than this. So they, they can really add uh, detail to this competency and then help you select which of them you will include in a, in a training or which ones you need to develop further as an individual. So in this slide, we have a more formal definition of the competencies. So a competency is an observable ability of any professional integrating multiple components such as knowledge, skills, and attitudes, which is the ones that we had in the, in the previous slide. And then the key aspects of this uh, competency-based approach is that competencies are observable, so acquisition can be validated objectively. And, and then you can um, show the evidence, I mean, have the evidence of this competency collected in a competency portfolio. So then they can be shared currency uh, that are applicable to, to different types of learning and at all career stages. So you can always uh, show this evidence of that you acquire this competency of uh, installing software or of uh, uh, using uh, Linux skills or, or having some more scientific uh, knowledge, such as life sciences knowledge. So in the, when we are talking about the competency profile of uh, PERMIT, we have the competencies that are here at the, at the middle level. And this is what is quite usable to as a shared currency and so. But then we group them in several domains, which will be above the competency, just to have an idea. For example, we have computing competencies and we have uh, computational personalized medicine competencies that are uh, more in the, on the 
science, life sciences part um, of the permit COE uh, knowledge base, let's say. And then, as we showed you before, we have we increase the level of detail of each competency by defining some knowledge, skills, and attitudes uh, that are where we can really define if we are designing a training program, as we're going to do, we can define which specific uh, skills or knowledge we need to uh, make people develop in this training. So <laughs> the competencies can be used uh, for many different things. And here, uh, there are some examples of this. So you can use them for course development. That is what we have done in the when designing the training program uh, for permit. So <laughs> the competencies can guide you on what content to include in specific courses and at which level uh, to pitch it, because it's going to depend on which competencies you want to achieve and also uh, what is the level at which your uh, audience is. And then you can also uh, write learning outcomes depending on the competencies, so they can guide you to do that. And in fact, sometimes you are going to use the learning outcomes as the way uh, to present the competencies to the participants in the course, so they are not going to see the competencies per se, but the learning outcomes are defined uh, based on the competencies, and that's how this information arrives to your audience in the course. Then they can also serve for strategic planning in an organization or a, a consortium such as a permit. So uh, are you covering the priority areas or target groups? So um, if you build these competencies, you can define which are your priority areas and then you can see if that aligns with all the all the competencies that you have and which are the ones for a target group or another that yeah, you will see we are developing even further with career profiles. And they can also help you with consensus building. So by working on, on building the competency framework, uh, you talk within uh, the organization with the other people and then you can align your ideas about what the most relevant competencies uh, for your community are and that also uh, makes that everybody's on the same page, let's say. And it can show uh, an overview to your stakeholders so that it's uh, very clear uh, what the competencies you're working uh, with are. Uh, they can also serve for career development. So it can be for your for continued professional development. So you can have, they can guide you through which competencies you want to develop further in your uh, career development. And they can also be a guide for annual appraisals or assessments because <clears throat> you can see which are the competencies that that person should have developed on, on that uh, year or which ones they need to focus on for the next uh, assessment. And of course, they can be used in staff hiring as defining the competencies helps you see where there are gaps and which competencies will your uh, team need uh, for a new hire. And uh, of course, whether there is um, sufficient overlap between the competencies needed and the ones in the team and the ones that uh, a new hire will, will bring. So <clears throat> when we are uh, building a competency-based training program, we start by creating and defining these uh, competencies within a group in the, in the case that we talked today would be the permit COE, but we have done this in, in several other projects. And then we take the existing training resources that are mostly online, but it could also be a face-to-face -face course, um, and we collect them and see how they match to the competencies. So basically we check which competencies can we achieve with the training resources that already exist. Uh, and therefore we will find the gaps where there are some of these competencies for which very few training resources exist uh, or no training resources exist. And then of course, those could be the higher priorities for our training program, because for the ones that already exist, we can always tell people, oh, you could use this training resource uh, to develop this specific competency. Uh, <coughs> and then another way to enrich a competency profile is to use uh, user profiles so to understand your audience and see which um, competencies they need to, to develop, where their gaps are. Um, and for this, you can do some uh, high-level uh, user profiles, which would be uh, these ones we have here, entry-level user or specialist user. So for example, this one says, hi, I'm Mark, and I'm a discovery biologist who wants to find potential interaction partners for a new target. 
I haven't used modeling software at all. Um, so, you know, this one would need really the, all the training for entry-level users. So then from this um, high-level users, entry-level specialist uh, user or system administration applications, uh, we can further develop some more detailed uh, career profiles that uh, I'll show you later, which ones we did for, for permit and how we, we did them. But then again, that helps us for strategic planning or defining, defining our target audience. And they are always mapped to the competencies so we can see there uh, where are the gaps. And we have different levels of these competencies. But again, I'll, I'll show you that later. And from there, we can also create learning pathways. So if there is any specific challenge that one of these uh, career profiles has, one of these you know, uh, personas has a specific challenge, we can create a specific learning pathway uh, for them to, to uh, how to say, to address that um, topic that they have. And again, I'll show you some examples of this later. Um, Shall I take over again from here yeah. for the last two slides? Yeah. Um, so one of the things that um, you have to consider working with competency frameworks is they evolve over time. So um, once you've created your initial um, framework, you aren't really done yet. Um, some of the reasons we found in the past that competency profiles evolve is, for instance, the field or the research area changes. So in our case, often these profiles are linked to particular projects They might go into a new funding stream, or you might have new collaborators joining, or users give you feedback and actually it means that you want to tweak particular areas um, of the profile. The other thing is that really using the profile means it highlights the areas that are the most important. Um, it often highlights ways that you can simplify the profile and it highlights where there are any gaps. So what that means is you're not really using one um, profile um, all the time, you will be creating different versions. Um, some of the things that we've seen in the past that happen is, for instance, we deprecate competencies, we dissolve them so that we can actually make them more specific. Um, sometimes we merge them together. Um, what we have found in the past as well is the number of KSAs isn't always um, um, the same, um, and we'd like to bring a bit of consistency um, into that. And sometimes we uh, remove things that feel um, like they're duplicating. Um, all of these kind of operations that, that happen over time, there are definite similarities to what you might see in um, ontology terms or controlled vocabularies. Next one slide, please. So what I want to talk about now is the reason for really developing the competency hub. And um, that mainly came from the need to have a sustainable home for all of this work. The kind of previous situation we were in was that competency profiles were published maybe in a project deliverable. Um, they were sitting around in spreadsheets or PDF documents. Maybe you uploaded them to a website, but there wasn't really a friendly way to, to view them for the end user. Um, it was often unclear who the owner of a competency profile was, especially maybe after the project is finished. Um, not clear whether this is a profile that's still actively being maintained or whether this was created years and years ago. Um, and relatively, there was no one place to get a broad set of competency profiles. And I've already talked about the different versions. Um, and if you have them, for instance, in a PDF on this place, um, then maybe that was version one where someone else, somewhere else is actually a newer version kicking around. So that was some of the situation we were facing. The other um, Thing that drove us towards building the competency hub was that there wasn't really a suitable place for us to display the competency profile but maintain the mapping to the relevant training resources because we realized quite early on that actually by doing that type of mapping we were sitting on a really valuable data set that we wanted to expose to our user community to to allow others to find um to, to find useful training resources next slide please so that really was why we started building the competency hub. And lots of people have uh, built on this in the past. We started a small kind of beta trial and over time it's developed in, into the competency hub that Marta will, will show you. So at this point, um, what I will do is hand over to Marta and she will not only show you the, the current functionality of the competency hub, but also um, 
how it helps us provide training in the context of permit COE. Yeah, so uh, as Vera said, the Embele BI Competency Hub was uh, created to have this uh, home for uh, competency frameworks and to make them accessible for the community. So it helps uh, supporting competency-based training and professional development. So anyone can go there, access uh, the hub and all the information that it contains. And what you can do on it is to explore the competency frameworks, and then you can use them uh, for any of the things we we talked about earlier or for some other things that you find they can be useful for. Then you can find these training resources that we have associated to, to competency frameworks. And for the ones where we have created also career profiles, you can explore them and you can build your own profile. So you can assess yourself against those uh, competencies and you can compare uh, the profiles that are there. You can compare one profile against another one. And this can serve you to plan the next step. So it can help you deciding uh, what you would like to train on next, which competencies to develop further, uh, or also where you want to take your career. It's like uh, if you would like to become more like one of the other uh, career profiles that is there. And I'm going to show you all this uh, on the site itself in a moment. But before that, let me tell you a bit about uh, what we have been doing in Permit COE to develop a competency-based training program. So um, what we aim with this is the, that all our courses are focused on the abilities that are required by the professionals in the computer, in computational personalized medicine so that we can uh, really make an efficient use of our resources and also that we can focus on that skills gap that exists in the community so that we can enable them to use the software that is developed uh, by PERMIT uh, for uh, cell level simulations. So the process that we followed uh, to make this uh, competency-based training program was to start by creating a competency profile. So defining all those uh, competencies that are required by uh, the people in the field. Uh, and to define those, we started with uh, some other uh, related competency profiles like the ISCB and the BioXL ones. Uh, and from that base, we also received input from all the partners in Permit COE to align what our ideas of the required competencies in the community were. And then once we had that list, we took existing training resources. And as I was explaining to you before, we mapped them uh, to the competencies. So we have this Permit COE competencies, we take the training resources and we see which of them uh, can help you develop one of those competencies. Uh, so we can make a gap analysis and see for which competencies there are fewer training resources. And that is where our training program will focus our efforts. And this will mainly be in the use of uh, modeling software and the use of uh, HPC systems. Uh, and all the, the information that was developed during this uh, process of creating the competencies and adding the training resources to it is in the Competency Hub now. So it's available uh, to everyone. So everyone can access it and can use it. Um, the competency profile of Permit COE contains 19 competencies in total. And seven of them are domain specific uh, for computational personalized medicine. And then seven of them are computing related to a computing domain and five are in a parallel computing domain. And those two, the computing and the parallel computing domain have been um, degree, uh, have been developed uh, jointly with uh, BioXL because BioXL is another HPC center of excellence that works on biomolecular simulations. So there are quite a lot of parallelisms between the two center of excellence. And we thought that it was good that they shared the same uh, computing and parallel computing competencies. And all of them have knowledge, skills, and attitudes to have more uh, detail in them. Here you can see some of the domain-specific ones, such as apply expertise in medical or life sciences, or handle data from end-to-end -end following best practice. Uh, and this is, I told you, it's all in the competency hub. And what I'm going to do now is to take you there uh, and show you with a demo from the site what we have from the Permit COE competency profile. So, 
So this is the, the competency hub landing page where you can see all the different students and professionals uh, for which we have uh, competency frameworks. So we have this one, for example, is for students and professionals in computational biology. We have also some for research infrastructure scientists and, and managers and some others pro for professionals working with clinical human data. But here I'm telling you about the, the Permit COE one. So we are going to visit these professionals in computational personalized medicine one. And when we go in there, we can see these different tabs with all the information that is available. So we have the competencies, the training resources, career profiles. Then we also have a tab where you can export all the data that is available in the, in the competency framework. So if we go here to the competencies, you'll see what I just showed you in the previous slide. We have all the permit COE competencies, the 19 of them, in uh, divided in three domains, computational personalized medicine, computing, and parallel computing. If I then click on one of them, we have here operate effectively within a Linux environment, for example, you can see all the detail of knowledge, skill, uh, and attitudes that we have inside the, the competency. And you can also click on this view training resources map to this competency, and you will see these training resources that have been added to the, to the competency hub in relation to this competency. If we now go uh, back, we can also see in the in the training resources page, we have all the training resources listed here with the competencies they are associated to uh, listed next to them. And we have also career profiles, as uh, we told you earlier. This can help us define our target audience and see where they have a uh, skills gap. And when you have them, these are the eight that have been created for permit uh, COE uh, until now. And if we visit one of them, you will see uh, how this works. So this is a reference persona. So it's not uh, some real person. It's just, it has been created with um, the ideas from different experts that, are, that have this role or that have had this role in the past. And for some of them, we have also used job ads uh, to, to write this description. So they consist of a, short description of the qualification and background of this persona, and then uh, the activities that they do in their current role. Uh, and below this description, you have uh, the full list of um, permit COE competencies and to which level they are applicable for this specific persona. So that can be awareness, working knowledge, or specialist knowledge. Uh, and then you can also see all the, the full detail of the competency if you if you open it. Once you are here, this is a, a molecular biology. So of course, for some of the parallel computing ones, they don't have uh, that much knowledge. But once you are in one of these profiles, you can also compare with another one. So for example, this uh, postdoc in molecular biology might have started doing some things in bioinformatics and might become interested in bioinformatics and consider that they want to do to follow a career in bioinformatics after this postdoc. So in that case, this person could go here to compare profile and check for the bioinformatician and have the comparison here. So you have the levels at which each of the two have in the different competencies. And uh, the postdoc in molecular biology can check which competencies he needs to develop further to become a bioinformatician. And you can see some of these, the, the applying data and so, and then especially the, the computing ones will need to be developed further if he decides to become a bioinformatician. Uh, and therefore, by knowing this, um, this, this person can put the effort in developing these competencies and finding training that helps them develop these uh, competencies. So one more thing that we can do with the uh, career profiles in the competency hub is to create your own one. So you can create a profile here. Um, and then you can write as much as you want in the, in the description. Then if you go to map competencies, you will be able to assess yourself uh, uh, against these competencies. So it can be a good exercise also to see where you are in your career and which of these competencies you would like to develop further. So, so you can go here and, and decide, you know, 
read about it and think about it and decide which knowledge you have. And if you want to be more precise, you can go into the, the level of the knowledge skills and attitudes and see which ones you already have and which ones you would already uh, need to, to develop further. So you can just uh, click or unclick them. Once uh, you save this, it will be saved in your browser. So if you go there, it will appear um, in the competency hub page. But you can always delete it and create a new one if you want to um, to check yourself, you know, in, in some time in the future. So if we no now go back to the presentation. Let me just skip some slides. I had some screenshots in case we couldn't do the demo. So I'll go here to the training resources. So I show you this page with the training resources that we have mapped to the permit COE competencies. And they helped us uh, define where the gaps were and which courses we wanted to, to develop in the permit COE training program. But apart from that, we also want to help our community by putting some of these training resources depending on uh, their most important needs. So, and this will be in the in the form of learning pathways, which are collections of trained resources about a specific topic. This is an example of a learning pathways developed by BioXL, which is using Jupyter nodules for biomolecular research. And these learning pathways can contain a combination of different types of trained resources. So it can be a, an actual live course, but it can also be a recording of a webinar or some papers or manuals that can help you um, in learning about this specific topic. So, of course, this one using Jupyter Notebooks could be also helpful for the Permit COE community. Uh, and Permit COE is working on developing some of these uh, learning pathways so that we can put together the most uh, useful resources for specific challenges that our community has. So, to summarize what we have in the Permit COE competency framework, we have a list of competencies divided in three domains, uh, computation, one about computational personalized medicine, um, one about computing competencies, and one about parallel computing. And apart from this, it includes career profiles and training resources that are uh, associated to the competencies in the, in the framework. And you can access all that information in the competency hub. And then in the future, we will also offer some learning pathways that are uh, right now under preparation. So just to end this presentation, I would like to tell you that when we work with these competencies, we also uh, follow best practice. So we are in contact with uh, other people that also develop uh, competency profiles. Um, and what we do and what the Competency Hub helps us to do is uh, a series of things such as uh, versioning our own profile. So in the Competency Hub, if we have a new version because as Vera, uh, as, as we said earlier, this, um, these competencies evolve uh, over time and we can uh, merge some of them or deprecate some of them. But we have these different versions all published. So we have the old archive versions are available. And the newest one is the one that you see when you go uh, first on the site. And there are release notes that explain what are the changes between one version and another. We also have persistent identifiers for the competencies and KSAs, which will uh, help in making it machine readable and working on to making uh, competency frameworks fair. That is something that we are really interested in. And um, because they are, we are having them in the competency hub and we are uh, saying who has developed it, there's a clear ownership of the frameworks. And as we have said during the presentation, they are publicly accessible. So anyone can. Uh, get all the data that is there. Um, so if you want to, if you're interested in what we are, we have been telling you today, and you want to give us feedback about the site or about the frameworks, the content that is in the site, if you want to suggest training resources or make suggestions on what to, to add to the, to the tool, which kind of features we could add, uh, you can contact us on competency at ebi.ac.uk. Um, I would like to finish by thanking everybody who has been involved in both the development of the site and the creation of the Permit COE Competency Framework. 
because it's uh, quite a lot of people involved. So thanks to the Permit CA Consortium, the ABI training team, the ABI Web Development team, the BioXL Consortium, and the SCB and Education Summit Competency Working Groups. And thank you very much to all of you for listening. And let us know if you have any questions. Remember, you can write them in the, using the Q&A button in Zoom. Thank you very much, Martin Vera, for the, that uh, very nice presentation. Um, yes, as, as Marta just mentioned, please uh, include your use, put your questions in the using the Q and A button. Um, I have a. I wanted to ask a, a question. Um, how how do you in the when you start to create a competency framework? How do you decide which initial uh, competencies to include or like who is involved in in doing that well in the case of the of the permit one for example of the permit CA one it was the people in the in the consortium but because we already knew that bioxcel and iscb were quite similar because one is for computational biology the other one is for um biomolecular uh, simulations, we knew we could start with those ones as they are uh, quite similar, quite related to it. If you start more from, from scratch, let's say, you would need some experts in the community or in the field that you want to address with that competency framework, and then start deciding which are the most relevant competencies that people in the field could need. And you can combine this with having some of the main, you know, the high level user profiles to help you decide which are the relevant competencies that you would need there. Yeah, and I think maybe one thing to add, what we found in the past is that it's much easier if you're going to, for instance, involve um, a large group of stakeholders in creating the initial draft, even having a rough draft that you've put together with one or two people is better than starting from zero because having, um, a kind of blank piece of paper can be difficult for people to start from. So even if you have one or two people, a small working group that can just draft out initial kind of lines of, of uh, content can really help before you go to a larger group of experts. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. And I think maybe one tiny thing to add, what I would say the danger of this approach is, is that you, um, have a high level of detail of the areas that you have experts in and maybe less good coverage for um, either niche areas or user groups that are not so well represented in your stakeholders or your community. So that's definitely something to be aware of and maybe ask, uh, for instance, if you had an initial set of stakeholders, if you know that you're missing, um, for instance, initially in one of our projects, we were really missing the HPC sysadmin angle because those weren't the people that were in the initial stakeholder uh, workshop then you really have to separately go out and find additional experts to give input on. So I would say that's probably um, the biggest danger to this approach. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> well, just just um, for all the audience, there was a question in the chat that was uh, in the Q&A that was already answered. Uh, someone uh, asked, tried to access a training resource, uh, but nothing was displayed. Um, so it just, for some reason, a training resource might not, uh, might not, uh, work like uh, some link. Yeah. Uh, there's, but... there's some issue with loading those training resources, but our web development team is working onto it. It seems that in one of the last updates of the sites, there was something, uh, that went wrong there, but yeah, it's going to be fixed in the next, uh, couple of days. Yeah. Because the competency hub, I mean, as, as you said, is a very alive uh, platform where there are continually um, new features released and everything. So it might be that, that some they are working on something particular at the moment. Um, so yeah, in case in case a, a link a Twitter resource does not work, you can you can try uh, later, for example. So actually, I wanted to ask about the training resources. Uh, what kind of training resources are available in the competency hub, like? who has developed those training resources? It's usually training resources that are available 
online. So it can be many different things. So we have things from um, MBLE BI. Uh, so from all the training courses and so are usually there, but we we have also the webinars that we are running in different projects like Permit CO or BioXL, we have some of those, but we can have uh, courses from Software Carpentries or Coursera. So it's like, we are just in the competency hub, we are not developing those resources. We are just linking them. So they could be from other universities. They can also be in some cases, there are manuals to HPC uh, centers, or they can be some papers if we consider that it's relevant enough for the for the competencies that we are developing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and for most of our projects, a good place to start is to ask um, partners where they get their own training resources, uh, what kind of training they're involved in, and then we kind of add to that by, uh, by searching for relevant resources. Um, but people can also let us know if they've got training resources that they think are really relevant and they're not currently in the competency hub. I would say drop us an email to that email address that was on the previous slide, and then we can make sure that we make it available through the hub. But as Marta said, it's not that the courses are directly hosted, it's just we're linking out to relevant training resources, which is why they're mostly online, because of course those are accessible and more relevant than a face-to-face -face course that might only happen once a year, for instance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for the answers. Um, another question, are the, 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 the slide you showed in the end with best practices about uh, creating uh, competency profiles, um, are those best practices something that are available to others uh, if they would like to start creating their own competency profile in their field? Are those best practices published uh, somewhere, for example, if they if someone wants to find them? I think they are coherently published as a set. Uh, I think there are a number of papers that have, have come out of, for instance, the ICB uh, competency group, and I think some of them will be in there. Um, but I don't think this is something that as a community we've ever specifically published. Um, I think if all of us would have more time, then maybe a 10 simple rules paper would be brilliant, but these are all things that kind of tend to slip off the to-do list a little bit. <laughs> I would say if someone did want to start and wanted um, uh, information, that the best thing is to, to contact us and we can then make sure that they become aware of the kind of growing group of people and, and the competency working groups that are available. Um, mm -hmm. Basically through interaction, I would say, is the main reason these have, these have come up. Yeah, on the, on the competency hub page about, there is also additional document, uh, the, additional documentation. So there are also some gui guidelines that ISCB or BioXL. So some of the groups have worked on, but it's not, yeah, it's not a coherent set as, as Vera said, but there is some information that people can find there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And they also have this webinar now. <laughs> yes. um, another question from the audience, uh, are there any possibilities or measures to certify competencies? What could possible solutions be here? Are there quizzes or similar things planned? So, I mean, of course, there are some, let's say, bodies that work. So there are some engineering bodies, for example, that work through competencies, and then you might have in those ways to certify them. ISCB is working to certify some courses, like some degrees at universities in relation to their competency framework. But we have not, plan to do like some official certification in the competency hub, uh, but we do have some quizzes related to the learning pathways that we have. So in that sense, you can, where we have quizzes, you can see whether you have uh, learned what, you know, what the learning outcomes for those uh, learning pathways were. Okay. Okay. Um... Okay, um, let's uh, give it a couple minutes to see if uh, anyone else in the audience has any more questions. Maybe meanwhile, Marta, you can move to the next slide uh, just to show the upcoming webinars. Um, you can already in the permit website, you can visit uh, the recordings from the previous webinars and you can sign up for the upcoming sessions. 
So the next one will take place on the 21st of June, where we will uh, show some of the use cases of Permit COE, how, how the project is, is uh, progressing um, to create these mathematical models uh, for personalized medicine. Uh, and then we will resume uh, after summer in October, still the date we confirm, with a webinar about all those aspects of data protection and security when uh, working with personal data in high performance computing. Okay, so I don't think we have any more questions. So with that, I would like to just uh, thank very much uh, Martin Vera for the, for the very nice presentation and for everyone else to, to attend the webinar and see you in the next uh, permit uh, webinars. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, bye. Bye.